everybody. Welcome to Touch Tennis Show. I'm Rashid Ahmed. As always, Sunday nights with Chris Eaton. How you doing, guys? Uh, we've had an uh, interesting weekend, uh, Fed Cup follow-up. Chris will go through some of that with us. But what we're also going to be discussing tonight is the worst of British commentary. Who are the worst tennis commentators out there? Now, personally, you know I've got my opinions on some of those. And Andy Murray has just hit what an unbelievable forehand, Mr. I can't lick someone's butt enough. Um, I might mention his name later on, Mark Petchy, but, um, but maybe not yeah. now. Who else? Um, but straight to the tennis, first of all. I want to talk a little bit about what you think has been going on this week and this month, uh, in fact. Yeah, I mean, obviously this month's been, you know, what, the, wind down of the, the wind down of the year. It's been uh, quite a lot of tennis for these guys, actually, especially people like Burdick and Ferrer. Yeah. I mean, Ferrer's played, you know, he, he was on a winning streak of something like 11 matches, because I think he won yeah. Valencia, then Paris back to back and then did well at the the year end masters cup so i think he had the that was the longest uh, ever win streak he's had and then he went straight into davis cup which was obviously this weekend and that's that's two matches for him cuz he yeah. played doubles um but yeah the uh, the davis cup final was was a big one uh, i think you'll probably find that uh, i called the checks to sneak it yeah uh, on the show maybe a few weeks ago and the checks snuck it in so. fairness it was quite a slow call so you know it was an easy call they just got to have the knowledge. It's all yeah. about the knowledge. But um, no, it was a it was a good weekend actually. It was kind of uh, fairly evenly matched. Uh, slightly slightly surprised at a couple of the results. Maybe I mean you would have expected the first two results in the first day. Burdich took out Almagro and yeah. uh, Ferrer took, took out him five to beat him though. Yeah, he does that Burdich sometimes. You know, he did the same thing uh, against Monaco in Argentina. He was down and then he sort of pulled it back. He loves loves the Davis Cup, plays really, really well at Davis Cup. Burdich. And you were saying something about his record earlier on. Yeah, well, his record, his record in singles is very solid. I think he's, he's certainly got a positive, um, positive record in singles. But his record in doubles is, uh, for a guy who never, ever plays, plays doubles, yeah. it's 16-1. Uh, and one. He's only ever lost once wow. from 16. I mean, that either says... He is seriously pumped for Davis Cup, yeah. or Stepanek's really good. Yeah, but <laughs> I mean, he hasn't both. played all of them with Stepanek, has he? Not all of them, yeah, no, because so. they had um, De Louis in yeah. the team for a bit. He was top five doubles player, so, you know, they, they, they've got you some You ever played that guy? There. No, I haven't. I actually saw him really weirdly, actually. He was still 10 in the world, he took a little bit of a break, so yeah. he dropped to like 10 in the world. And he was at a future I was at in France, Yeah, just playing a bit of singles, playing a bit of doubles. I don't really know what he was doing there. And uh, he didn't win the doubles, which is pretty pretty weird. <laughs> yeah, number 10 in the world, yeah. yeah. But, is that because uh, you were playing the doubles and you beat him? Or, no, you know, no, no, I certainly didn't win that doubles. No, I, I actually don't think I played then. Um, obviously, I would have won it. Yeah, of course. But, uh, you know how it is. Yeah, uh, these are tennis got, balls, yeah, not sponge. No, no, you got to give other people chances sometimes. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just bow out and say, you know what, I'll let you have a win. That's what Federer doesn't do that that well. You know? Yeah. That's what he should learn from me, potentially. You know, so... 70 million in the bank says otherwise. Yeah, but, you know, it's money details. But you're going to be getting 55 miles per gallon. Uh, no, well, who knows, who knows. I mean, just... Uh, Having just experienced your new car, uh... but we're talking about yours because we're thinking about a day of borrowing Chris's car because he just handed mine away last week by betting that I would lose to Elliot Seabrook. Well, let, let's be straight about this. I'm blind in one eye at the moment, and I'll have an up mid mid December. Um, but up until then, I'm still playing one eyed. So you've challenged, you know, you've I, accepted the challenge on my behalf and said I can have my car. So what's I, the what's the forfeit for you? What should we do to to give away yours for a day? I'd like to point. Hang on. First things first, I'd like to point out that I said when you were fully fit. Oh, did you? I didn't yeah. hear that part. When you were fully fit. We don't want any of, you know, no, 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 I can't deal with it. The viewers can't deal with all your whining and moaning about this I've one never eye. moaned or whined about anything. You no, know, the fact that you've only got one eye that can see is pretty embarrassing that you're not wearing an eye patch. Because any excuse to wear one of them is pretty cool. Let's yeah, there, there is a problem with wearing one of those. <laughs> I was tempted to walk around like the guy from Airwolf. Does anyone remember that show? <laughs> I think you're showing your age here, mate. Uh, no, it's an epic show. <laughs> if you haven't watched it, download it. It's unbelievable. The guy flies his helicopter around and all of his acting is just one eye. By the way, we've got Nick Lester on the ground at the O2 Arena. So we're just going to go to Nick quickly. Nick? Hello, Nick. Uh, you're on the show with Chris. How are you doing? I'm very well. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. We tried to get the video feed this week, but unfortunately some technical issues at our end. Um, but good to have yeah. you on the phone. How did you enjoy the uh, the Davis Cup weekend out there? Uh, listen, incredible. My first ever experience with a Davis Cup final, and I tell you what, if you ever get a chance to come to one, it was outstanding. I mean, the Czech Republic, as I'm sure you're aware, winning 3-2. First time since 1980, they've 
won this trophy and, and uh, just extraordinary scenes. I mean, the O2 Arena here holds about 14,000 people and they tell me they could have sold it out three times over. Wow. Uh, just extraordinary. And, and you know, this, this tennis year has had so many different stories to it and for Radek Stepanek to win the fifth rubber uh, in front of his home fans, 34 he is in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, extraordinary. Just amazing. It's not that, I was winning majors when I was 34, so it's not that big a deal. <laughs> but you're an exception. Yeah, sorry. I, I can't judge <laughs> others by my standards. But you were saying a couple of weeks ago, along with Chris actually, about you know, the Czechs being potentials for the double Fed, uh, Fed Cup and the Davis, and the Davis Cup. Cup. Yeah, I don't know how to trick the one Hopkins Cup as well. And the first time in history it's been done that a team has won three competitions uh, uh, like this in, in a single year. I mean, they've done a pretty quick call out here. It was always going to be the way. They're not going to put down a, a slow call against the Spaniards. Uh, Ferrer was outstanding this morning. He won both his matches. Uh, he, he beat uh, this morning. He beat uh, Thomas Burdich pretty comfortably. Um, and then it was down with Stepanek against Almagro, who who just came up a little bit short. I mean, Stepanek was just fantastic. Yeah, old school tennis, you know, serving volley, coming in, picked up some incredible volleys, just coming in off everything pretty much. You know, second serve, getting in early, uh, just a joy to watch. And, and Almagro just just it came up a little bit short. Just. It can be a little one-dimensional, I think. I think the, the second string Spaniard, um, and it just got found out a little bit. Someone was saying on uh, Facebook earlier, an absolute muppet called Andrew Lockhart. Um, I met him out in La Manga. Mentally very frail. He said that if Almagro had better movement, he was a potential contender at slams. And I said, well, his second serve was never going to be good enough. And mentally, he just just doesn't have it. I mean, what what did what did this weekend tell us about him? I think he just needs to learn to come in more. I mean, he hits great off the bat. His forehand's great. He doesn't return serve well. The two factors for me are that can be short. He doesn't return particularly well, and he doesn't, he doesn't come in enough. I mean, there are opportunities today for him to come in at times. Um, he didn't do it. And uh, I think the occasion probably got a little bit to him. I mean, you know, Stefanek, these, these, two, these two guys are pretty big personalities. Stefanek's yeah. been around a long time. We all know he's a prickly sort of character. He likes to get in your face. In many ways, it was sort of occasion that was made for somebody like Stefanek today. Or me. Um, uh, you know, just just a, just a, 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 they laid laid down this call exactly for someone like that. I actually thought the call was almost a bit quick for Burdich, to be honest. This week at times, it looks as though even he was almost struggling to, to cope with it. But yeah, I, I noticed that. I watched on Friday, and he looked like he was struggling with the pace of the call. Yeah, I mean, I just thought he struggled. I mean, he, he just for me, he likes he likes a bit of time on the ball at times, and I just didn't think he had that throughout yeah. the weekend. I thought he looked tired today a little bit. I mean, he was thoroughly up pace, but. Uh, Listen, you know, it's a great story. The Lendl was here, Kodish was here, all the, the old boys from the team that won the 1980s were here this weekend. They invited them specially back. Um, and, and it was just great scenes at the end. And, you know, this, I have to say, I mean, this is my first ever experience of a Davis Cup final. And the atmosphere inside there is the best tennis atmosphere I think I've ever experienced. Well, great to hear you had some fun out there and good to have our man on the ground. What's next for you then? You're going to take a month off? Or? Uh, yeah, a bit of time off. And then I'm, I go to do the Aussie Open uh, for ESPN. I've got about five weeks at home and uh, a bit of painting and decorating, I think, on the car. Wow, sounds fun, sounds fun. Do you do you do the Australian Open from LA, is that I right? from the States, yeah. I work for ESPN, I do the first eight days over there, so... Uh, that must be, it. it must be a bit weird flying the wrong way around the world to do a tournament. Yeah, it, it, it kind of is, but obviously the time difference is such that you're almost sort of a full day behind, so uh, we're on out over there at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and we... Uh, we wrap it up about midnight, so it's actually not too bad, not too bad. But I think next on the cards is uh, a bit of touch tennis practice for me, Rashid. I don't know if you can be my, give me my coach, my mentor, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it'll be a bit like Lendl and Murray. You know, maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll steer you to your first slam because, you know, you... Uh, you know, I was known in my early days as a little hot-headed, a little bit prickly as well, a bit like Stepanek, but, you know, I, I came up with the goods eventually. You know, I went and saw a psychoanalyst as well. Um, I drove him mental. He's now in a psych ward. Um, but hey, you know, I, um, I dominated for years. So maybe I can do that for you too, Nick. Uh, I'll hold you to that. Okay, I'll hold you to that. But one last thing I want to discuss with you before we go. We are nominating today the worst yeah. commentators in British tennis. And you couldn't we... possibly comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> My profession is full of, full of, full of professionals who do a thoroughly fine job, I'll have you know. Okay. Yep. Um, and uh, I think, uh, I, I, from my 
perspective, I think, you know, uh, the job of a commentator is to provide something additionally to the coverage. And, and who's uh, your... If you're doing that, I think you're right, doing a good job. Who's your favourite commentator then? Worldwide or back in the UK? Back in the UK. Well, Barry Milne's is sitting right next to me, so I'm going to say Barry Milne temporarily. He's just laughing at me. <laughs> temporarily. Uh, I love Barry Milne. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think he's got some good things to say. Yep. Um, really? Yeah, okay. who else? Uh, yeah, it's such a mixed bag. It's yeah. such a mixed bag. I mean, there's a couple of guys in the States that are good. I should probably listen to guys in the States. Chris Fowler's quite good. He's a lead yep. commentator over there. Uh, he's good. Um, Darren Cahill's got some, some good things to say. You know, <laughs> I think, I think the uh, most important thing for a commentator is to be able to provide something on top of the television coverage. Because you, you know, you've got to think there's some radio coverage out there as well. Some of the guys in radio do a fine job. I know it's not always going to get the platform, but yeah. some good guys that work in radio as well. Um, but television-wise, yeah, uh, I think there's probably a couple of guys in the States who I enjoy listening to more above than anything else. Cool. Yeah. Well, we enjoy listening to you, and um, hopefully we'll get more feedback from you over the next few weeks and stuff, talking about the tour as we go into the next year. But um, more Pleasure. importantly, I'll, um, I'll hopefully guide you to your uh, first major. Very good. I'm off to the uh, dinner tonight as well, the ITF dinner. So I'm just about to get in the bus, and uh, I shall catch you maybe in a couple of weeks' time. Of course you are. Of course you are. Enjoy it, mate. <laughs> Cheers, Ned. So he's having fun in the Czech Republic uh, with Barry Mills, you might add. What kind of night do you think they're going to be up to? Oh, who knows? I mean, I have no idea what what the, the ITF dinner would, would have in store. I don't know how much how much fun they're allowed to have, they're meant to have, but I guess it's... It must be pretty much a Christmas party because it's last last tournament of the year for them. They can yeah. sort of blow off a bit of steam, but um, you know, blow off what? Sorry, a bit of steam. Oh, okay, bit sorry, steam, wasn't quite sure what you said there. <laughs> hey, everybody's got to get ahead in life. Um, yeah, well, they are getting some head. But it's good I mean, to know. Ahead. It's good to know that uh, it's good to know that Nick uh, Nick has a nice solid uh, career in politics after that. Yeah, last exactly. Answer, if, he, if he struggles to get any any commentary stuff. Yeah, I mean, if you. Nick, you know, if you're, if you're listening to this on the replay later on tonight, well, I doubt you're going to get home at any respectable hour tonight or tomorrow. But yeah, said it. Chris was first to say he called it. You know, you're going to be a great politician because you've got the ability to uh, to sound like you care <laughs> <laughs> and to not put your foot in it. Yeah. So your thoughts? I mean, you're surrounded by some professionals. It's going to be difficult for you to say. I mean, my uh, commentator woes. I mean, some of the things that people say on television are just Staggeringly bad, and they state the obvious. Yeah. Um, what is it with the, the culture in British commentary? For starters, that we we find they're always um, these are the bad ones. I mean, there are some great commentators. They're going to be wrong. I used to love Jerry Will- Williams. You know, it was great to listen to him. I like listening to Simon Reid. He's a, you know, he's great to yeah, listen to. Um, sometimes I like what Felgate's got to say. He's got you know, he's got a nice insight. He's been there on, by the side of a player for years. Yeah. So when he says, "What are they going to in a locker room?" He actually knows what it's like to go out for a semi-final. Um, there seems to be something else though that's just it's it's a tough one. I mean, because obviously we see it we see it slightly differently to sort of other people you know the, these commentators have to they have to cater for you know they have to get the right balance of catering for people who have a vast knowledge of the game like we do and then also people who don't have a very yeah. great knowledge of the game so they do have to state some obvious things which are obvious to us which may actually not be obvious to to other people yeah. potentially um, so that's why I guess we get we can we can get a little bit frustrated with it but um, the thing that I've always the thing that's always hit me about the commentary is uh, they uh, a lot of them seem to have a fear of being quiet and letting the tennis do the talking. Do yeah. the talking, yeah. you know. So You're not paid per word. No, just you, you kind put of that out there. Some, sometimes I just get the feeling that uh, you know you've got two, two, three, however many commentators in the box. Yeah. And they feel like they have to say something after each point, and they 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 always has to have some sort of. Apart from Pete um, Fleming. Apart from Pete Fleming... Who sounds like he is completely and utterly stoned all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love Pete. I know yeah. Pete, and I think he's, he's a great guy. So much yeah. fun to be around. Um, but yeah, you know, he, he, he sometimes gives up an aura of being slightly on another planet. Yeah. But I tell you, I'd actually tell you who does, who does quite a funny job yeah. of not always talking, but sometimes coming up with... He sometimes states the obvious, yeah. but he sometimes comes up with some really good 
funny, random stuff is Boris. Oh, Boris. He, he okay. is very amused. And he's like, God, so he's, and, you know, he's back end down the line and, you know, he comes in and then he puts the volley away and it's great volley, but then, you know, maybe put the volley in the back end corner and he starts to get a little Greg-like. He talks so quickly. <laughs> because he shuts up for so long, he suddenly feels so like he's got to, to earn his money. Yeah. And he just goes, blah, 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 and yeah. it's great back end down the line. It's always back end down the line. Yeah. You know, it's exactly. like, Boris, you know, you know enough about tennis. You could... And sometimes, actually, I don't like the way they pin him. And some, you know, half-wit next to him will say something completely unnecessary. Um, knowing that he's not eloquent enough to come up with the appropriate response. But you can almost see him looking at them like, oh, shut up, Petch. What have you ever done with your life? You know, sort of thing. <laughs> and it's not just God-given talent. It's desire. It's hard work. There's a reason he got to where he did in tennis. Yeah. It isn't just... I mean, sure, he had some amazing gifts, you know... 130 mile per hour serve when he was 17. Physically insane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have you seen those thighs? Yeah, They're like Marcus huge. Willis. Yeah. Exactly, but toned. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, I think, I think the commentary thing is, is, is an interesting one. I think, I'll tell you who I, I do actually really enjoy listening to. Yeah. Is, um, is Tim at Wimbledon. Yeah. Tim Hemm, because he normally gets put on with two other commentators, and it's actually, they actually normally have a really good team. They have an, an anchor, Johnny Mack, who talks a lot. Yeah. And Tim, who hardly says anything, but what he does say is amazingly relevant and yeah. so sort of right on it because obviously he's lived through the whole thing and he understands, he probably understands the British public better than anybody. Yeah, because you he know? had to yeah, cause carry he, them on his shoulders or yeah, have them, you know, had, you know carry him for with years. Them pretty yeah. much for 10 years or 15 years. So I think he does. What do you think of that, um, that hill? ever being changed from Henman Hill to Murray Mount. I think that's wrong. I mean, that was designed... It was, you know, I know that Murray's won a slam, but... Yeah, the, it won't... It, I guess it's the generation you grew up in, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, certainly for me, when I first started going to Wimbledon, and, um, you know, even even when I first played it, yeah. Andy was just sort of making his, his rise. He wasn't right at the top of the game like he is now. Yeah. Um, so it's always been Henman Hill for me, and it's difficult to change sort of classic yeah the classic things like that um, but I guess if you're if you're 12 right now and you've been to Wimbledon once or twice and they're sort of you've heard whispers of Murray Mountain you don't have the Hemman Hill sort of yeah constant ingrained into you head. but yeah. obviously our generation well I mean, you're, you're way older than me but uh, you know and wiser and smarter naturally better yeah, dressed and, yeah exactly certainly I can only, I can only afford uh, only afford ninety eight percent of jeans. Yeah, <laughs> they don't put the rest in. So yeah, um, but, uh, actually, for once you were in different jeans because normally they always have the tear on the left knee. Yeah, no, I, I do possess more than one pair of jeans. I thought it was only Hollister jeans you ever bought. These are Hollister jeans, <laughs> <laughs> but I only buy I only buy the sale items. So this must be the one they got the wrong knee on and <laughs> sold it cheap. <laughs> they must have. Must be wearing them back to front or something. Exactly. But uh, exactly. It's, I know it's, it's it's ridiculous, isn't it? We're talking about fashion and stuff when Emily's not here because what else was she here for? Let's not talk about tennis. <laughs> not that I'm knocking you, Emily, but Emily's out in Tokyo at the moment. She plays tomorrow against Pass. Sorry, are you looking at me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I meant to know this. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're the colour in this one. Uh, pass again. Yeah. Can I pass that back to you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fine. I'll go first on the one ball then. Yeah, we'll get the uh, we'll get the producer to go and uh, find that for us now and uh, come back to us at maybe you know twenty five to ten. Talking of producers, we have a uh, what was I going to say? A an internship available. Um, oh, we've got. Uh, Matt Gollidge has come in saying Greg Rosetsky is a D O U C H E. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say what that actually spells on air, but uh, shower in French, isn't it? It's shower, yeah, yeah. Douche, uh, yeah. The, uh, the bag la douche. It, yeah, um, can't stand him. Got to agree with you there, Matt. But um, I think you should call him with that one. Um, and uh, the number is up on the screen. It's o two o three three nine seven four o eight seven. If you want to ring in. Now, talking of Gollidge, I've got a little clip to show you here of me humiliating him with a kick serve. Now, I want you to bear in mind that this is, again, one-eyed, still damaged. Um, this is me using upper body rotation and incredible wrist snap to put the ball on the sideline two foot from the net and take him about 300 feet out of court. Willis then just pumps the volley down the center. You should watch this, and I, I think 
Take Should notes, I say potentially? it? Yeah, learn something from it, guys. Now that is how you do it, guys and girls. You turn your wrist like that, just snap it as hard as you possibly can. And it's about going after the ball. Don't see many kick serves on the game Emily plays. No. Why? It seems to be it seems to be something that female females basically struggle to produce as much racket head speed as guys. Okay. So, you know, they that's why they hit a flatter ball. Mm-hmm. Um, it's why someone like Stoza is a is an a rare anomaly, is an anomaly. Yeah. You know, because she has a genuine kicker, mm-hmm. genuinely fast racket head speed. I don't know why. Um, maybe it's how they're trained. Maybe it's the lack of a certain type of muscle fiber that they yeah. need for that. I don't know physiology of you know that sort of stuff. So, um, but it just seems to be seems to be that way. I mean, it, if you could teach if you could teach someone a kick, the reason why you use a kick serve is the same reason why you hit a topspin forehand. It's topspin, so it, you know you can give more height over the net and the ball will come the ball will come down. So it's a safer right. serve. That's why people use it for their second serves. So it's why in the men's game you see much fewer double faults than you do in the women's game. Right. Um, yeah, because I mean, you get women's games sometimes with 17, 18 double faults in a match. I mean, I'd, I'd be bordering on suicide after six. You know? Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't have any rackets left after six. Yeah. Because <laughs> they'd all be in pieces in my bag. But... Um, yeah, no, it's it's a strange one because the guys aren't the guys aren't using it as a weapon as much as they used to. Yeah, you know, I mean in the old days, Edberg, Rafter, these guys, yeah, Becker as well. First serve, kick love serve, love come in, get yeah. those guys way off court. And now, I'm not sure if it's to do with how the reason why that's not in the game anymore. I'm not sure if it's to do with how lively the courts are and the balls, right? Or how good people like Andy Murray deal with a with a high, yeah, a shoulder high backhand because obviously. We're talking about the rafter, the, the Edberg, you know, Becker era, you're talking about a lot more one handers. Yeah. And it's a fact that one handers are way weaker up yeah. shoulder height because obviously you don't have the strength than two handers are. So I you know, I, I would imagine it's part of each. You know, yeah. a bit of this and a bit of that. So but it, it's a shame. It's a shame because that's another variation of, of tennis that yeah. isn't quite here. I mean, you, you see people use it more um, at the French, the clay court season. Yeah, but again, that's it, the kick. Kick takes more on the clay courts. Right. Obviously, same as topspin gets more more jump, and also the French Open balls are lively. Right. Seriously yeah. lively, so you get more action. Out of it. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we got another tweet I can hear coming through. Um. <laughs> Actually, we've got one from. Um, Where's the clip of my volley I hit off your return from college? It just it didn't make it. It's on the cutting room floor somewhere. Sorry, mate. It's you just you're not up there. I mean, when you start serving like me and winning majors instead of just getting to the finals and gagging a two set lead, we'll start showing some highlights of your ability. But as it stands, you're number two in the rankings, and a forty year old man is number five. Um, Josh Goodall has also said, "Stop staring at Chris's crutch." Um, I'm not quite sure what to say about that. I mean, was it that <laughs> obvious? Was it really that obvious? Um, but yeah, so I thought there was a tweet going on there. We've got a message in here from Elliot Seabrook. Oh, there we go. Oh, God, here we go again. So, is your favourite shot to hit in touch tennis different to that in regular tennis? Boom, much love, the magician. Is that to me? I'm assuming it's to you, because if it was to me, he knows I'd just abuse him. <laughs> <laughs> not like you won't but you might um, abuse him a little less to be honest I've got the first thing I've got to say is a lot of respect for coming up with your own nickname yeah I like that the magician no, I didn't, well. he didn't I called him the magician why I, I don't know because he has it, no right to be called the magician it was funny that he made it up for himself no, no it's, just go it's magical throwing. that he can walk around in that deluded world <laughs> and think people don't notice how twatty he looks with a ponytail that's why oh dear um, and in terms of in terms of favourite shot, yeah, probably. I mean, in touch tennis, I can actually hit a forehand in the court. <laughs> <laughs> um, real tennis, uh, I love hitting my slice. Love hitting my slice. Love coming to the net, hitting sort of 
feel volleys that, that are sort of what I enjoyed the most um, but uh, touch tennis I love building the point because the, the whole thing I the whole thing I enjoy about touch tennis is that I can do different things and do them well and be effective with them you know different things on a touch tennis court than I can on a tennis court so it's it's a different uh, you know different vibe for me and it's why I enjoy it because you know I probably wouldn't enjoy it as much if it was just if it was just exactly the same as tennis on a smaller court yeah. because then there's no difference what, what's the point yeah. I guess but you know I touch tennis I have a 200 backhand um, you know I run around the baseline like a madman and they're all things that I can't do in uh, unreal tennis really alright we've got a caller here let's see who this is hello hello alright who's that it's Josh 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 Goodall how are you doing Josh Goodall uh, no just a quick question um, hang on hang on hang on well, hang on. Sorry, hang on, Josh. Can you just confirm you are Josh Goodall? You could be anyone calling in. Um, uh, tell me your... Jake. No, I want to know um, who is the leading scorer at Chelsea this season? Uh, Fernando Torres. Yeah. Oh. Matter, matter. Matter, no, he yeah. doesn't know. <laughs> he doesn't know. He can't Call be Josh. A fan. <laughs> Call yourself a fan. It's oh, disgraceful. No. <laughs> Go on then, Josh. What's your question, mate? <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a personal. It's part of the reason why I love touch tennis is you can go for stupid shots like that. You know, when you're playing against someone like Rashid, who's um, just passing his 87th birthday, it's quite easy to uh, to love him because he doesn't move that well. Um, yeah, I didn't know that too. But you do you do get people who absolutely net rush and get as close as they can to the net, and because touch tennis, you can actually really rip really rip the ball, get a lot of spin on it, you can hit genuine topspin lobs, and it's probably the most satisfying thing in the world. Yeah, that's got to be the best, I was going to say, that's got to be the best shot to hit. The best feeling. Yeah, no, yeah. it's right up there. Uh, if you uh, well, tune in next Sunday, Josh, just for you, we're going to show some highlights of some of the greatest lobs of all time, and maybe even a couple of hot dogs. Obviously, yeah, obviously Hello? Yeah, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm sorry. I've yeah. got the live thing going at the same time. It's probably what's making me all confused. Yeah, you should just turn your iPad off and just uh, hear us down the phone line. It'll be a lot simpler. You won't get the, the, the uh, delay. There's a five-second yeah. delay because we don't want you saying something stupid on air. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we can just cut the call off quickly before everyone hears about it. But there's no way I'm going to get from here to the computer to cut you off in time. So I've got a question for you, Josh. Who is the worst okay. commentator in British tennis right now? Um... because <laughs> you won't ever get into that world. Now, the thing with Barry Cowan, uh, and, and I'll say this as well, I think he's actually a, a thoroughly decent guy. Uh, and from what I hear, he hasn't got the easiest time in the world at Sky from some of his co-commentators anyway. But he, 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 he tries too hard. Um, and I think if he tried a little less hard, he actually has, a lot of the time, got some sensible stuff to say about technique, uh, but, yeah. not less, but just not about tactics. Fair enough. I mean, Barry, uh, knowing him a little bit as a player, he was quite... One dimensional. He was a he was a serve volleyer. Yeah, you know, big game didn't move that well. Um, so I guess tactics might not have been his strong point, which yeah. is which is fair enough because that's that's kind of how he played. Unlike unlike Joshy Boy over here, who can do anything on a court, huh? <laughs> you experienced that, Chris. What was that? You've experienced that. Yeah, oh, I've experienced it. Yeah. Hang on a second. I, I, I've got a bet here. I'm going to put this out there. I'm going to put... I don't know. What should we say in terms of value? I want to see a, a showdown between Josh Goodall and Chris Eaton on a touch tennis court. Okay. Oh, to be fair, it's about time I beat him or something. Because <laughs> <laughs> he gets me every time on a real tennis court. Josh, I reckon Eaton is going to beat you. Well, I mean, I need to have a few... I'll, I'll come over to yours and have a practice, actually. Okay. And then I'll... How, um, how much practice time do you have? Should we Saturday, then? Around Christmas time. Around Christmas. I don't see why we don't do it next Sunday. Next Sunday. Yeah. 
Sunday. How about Chelsea next Sunday? Well, you don't even know who the leading scorer is. Don't pretend you know who the leading scorer is. There's a lot of many at the moment, that's why. <laughs> Who's the leading scorer for West Bromwich Albion then? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh dear, good stuff, Jack. Right. Right, well, well, listen. Thanks for calling in. All the best. We'll speak to you soon. Yeah, Cheers, yeah. mate. Take care, right. ladies and gentlemen. That was Josh Goodall, Britain's number two, and uh, he's about two thirty in the rankings at the moment. We wish him all the best for next year. He's going into his training block now. Yeah. What does that entail for a player of the next four or five weeks? I mean, you've done it so many times. What's yeah. It like? uh, unpleasant. <laughs> unpleasant is the main word I can use. Uh, you know, he will be. He will be training probably, probably six, five and a half, six days a week. Um, he probably, depending on, it all depends on the person's preference. For example, for me, uh, I was not one of those players who needed to hit balls every day, every couple of days to yeah. keep my eye. And I was always quite, because um, I, because I wasn't necessarily the most robotic player I did a lot by feel so it wasn't too important for me to keep playing keep playing keep playing so I would take a couple of weeks without hitting tennis balls at all and just right. go mental on the fitness you know so it'll be you know Josh will be Josh will be in the gym he'll probably do two fitness sessions uh, a day you know looking at weights so split between weights cardio stuff which is interval training which is horrible um, he'll do some plyometrics you know, power training, all depending on what his goals are for the for the end. You know, someone like someone like me, I always need to work on my speed. Okay. So I would always base the whole of the fitness block. You know, the main goal would be around getting explosive power into my legs. You know, okay. get, working on the fast twitch muscles. Uh, Josh plays. Josh plays a pretty all round game. You know, big serve, but plays a lot from the back. Um, so he will have to potentially have more of an all round fitness. So right. he'll do more endurance than I would um, potentially less sort of power stuff um, so he'll have quite a balanced balanced sort of uh, a time of it but it's so tough doing the fitness block here because you know you're out so a lot of time you're outside running on a track it's freezing yeah. you know you've got to really just find the motivation but it makes you tougher for it and you know this this is all this is just the training part this isn't to mention the ice bars and the the nutrition, eating healthily the whole time, making sure you you know your fridge yeah. at home stocked up exactly how you need it, that sort of stuff. And it's you know it's it's tough, it's really tough. But the uh, the benefits and the gains you get out of it, not just physically but mentally. You know when you step on the court first first tournament of next year, yeah. you know you get confidence. You haven't played a match, but you feel amazing because you know deep down you put everything yeah. you can into this training block and you're in the best possible shape. Yeah, you know that you can be in. And so you know. We wish Josh Josh the best. I'm actually uh, I might call Josh and see if I can do a bit of training with him. You know, yeah. try to help him out, see, show him what a real athlete does. Uh, yeah, you know. Just listening to that makes one. me want to smoke. So yeah. maybe I should go give him some <laughs> advice as well. You know, because I I mean I, I know I don't look it underneath this exterior, but you know I am actually the perfect physical specimen for any sport. Apart from Thai boxing, maybe. No, actually, I'd be a great Thai boxer. Yeah, you're, you're, you're pretty much the perfect specimen for any sport. I'd need to shave involve... my chest for Thai boxing, though. Yeah, but any sport that doesn't involve running, sort of endurance, darts, speed, strength. Yeah, exactly. Darts, darts, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm now going to become the goat at darts. Simple yeah. as. Which is, uh, I'd quite like to uh, point out that uh, this question got posed to me the, uh, the other day, and, you know, who's, who's the greatest sportsman of all time? And um, technically, if we... If we if we include darts as a sport, I think Phil Taylor <laughs> is the greatest dominating his sport. So Phil think? Taylor, hang on, congratulations hang on. on being the best sport. But if we include touch tennis as a sport, I'm technically the greatest sports player of all time. I think, I think Phil dominated more than you. Are you serious? Yeah, and his is a legitimate sport that you didn't make up. I didn't make up touch tennis. It, it came to me in a dream. I was, I was in a cave in the mountains in Mecca. Um, oh, hang on, that's someone else's story. I can't make that one. Um, I'll come up with another one next week. Don't worry about it. But anyway, if you tuned in tonight, I really appreciate you watching, as we always do. Um, next Sunday, we're going to be looking at um, some awards for the end of the season, um, awards for touch tennis players, as well as awards for tennis players. So we'd love your nominations. If you've got any, please send them in, tweet them in. We're going to have the Facebook feed on here next week as well. So if you message in, it'll be live, and the tweet feed will be live on the screen. Uh, we're still trying to get everything perfect technically so that you've got a better experience when you tune in but we do appreciate anyone that watched and thanks for Nick Lester on the ground um, out of the O2 in Prague uh, giving us a post-match report as always 
Chris, thanks for joining us. It's been amazing, yeah. And thanks, Josh, Enjoyed for calling it. in. And we will see you again next Sunday at the same time. Take care, guys.